This is an interview with Francis Snyder on October 24, 2007. We're in Studio X, Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Interviewers, Nancy Rotzel. The videographer is Henry Radcliffe. Okay. Francis, tell me about where you, where you, where were you born? I was born in Rankin, Illinois. And you were there when World War II started? No, I had, by that time I was working in Chicago. It was really hard to get a job during, during the per that period because I graduated from high school in 1935. And uh, it was at the end of the Depression. It was very difficult to get a job. And, and uh, at that time, uh, people especially people who were not affluent, had no idea about uh, loans for school or that sort of thing. So uh, I was a girl, too. And who educated girls? <laughs> Only people who had money. And my dad was a railroad worker, so he did. we were comfortable. But, and he always had a job. But um, I went to Chicago to work. I had a cousin who worked at uh, Spiegel's. In fact, she was a corporation secretary, and she made arrangements for me to be hired. So I went to work at Spiegel's, the mail order house. So that's where you were when World War II started? I was started? working there, yes. Yes. And um, uh, I also, uh, I liked Chicago. It was a great place to be young and single in. Mm -hmm. And I went to the uh, Chicago Arena to skate. A lot of times I had a, it was something I really enjoyed. It was a wonderful exercise because I sat a lot at work. And uh, on the Sunday morning of, of uh, Pearl Harbor, why I had gone to mass very early and then I went down to uh, the uh, arena to skate. And uh, we were interrupted about 10, 15, 10, 30, with an announcement that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. It was such a shock because we knew that the Japanese had just been in Washington, and we thought they had kind, sort of resolved their differences. So it was a, a very much of a shock. So and I had two brothers that were already in the service, one of them was in Panama. He was my youngest brother, and he had been in in the uh, the um, Air Force force for almost a year. He gra he he joined right after he graduated from high school because uh, he knew he couldn't get a job in Rankin, and he was sort of desperate. And he thought, well, why not? He'd get a trade or learn something, and he was sent to uh, mechanic school in Chinook. And uh, that had just begun to blossom. It had been a uh, an air base during World War One, but uh, and there were always uh, men there. But uh, in in uh, 1930 or 41, 40 and 41, why it uh, they began to really trained men. That was one of the biggest problems with the United States was that that uh, they didn't have a standing army of any size. And so it was imperative to get these men in. And, and my oldest brother worked in Chicago and he worked for a, um, uh, a commercial artist studio. And he was sent to, uh, he was drafted. And he went to, uh, Trenton, New Jersey, to the uh, base there, and they discovered he could play the bugle. They needed buglers, so he ended up playing the bugle. And because he did that, they sent him to a new base in Camp Crowder, Missouri. No, it was Neosho, Missouri, and he was sent to Camp Crowder, and uh, uh, it, for a band, they were forming a band there. So he played the alto horn in the band, and because he had some very good um, uh, office skills, he became the uh, uh, the radar, the company clerk. And he he sat out the whole war there. He didn't sit it out, but he was there during the whole war. They had to go on bivouac and be trained as soldiers, 
but he never had to leave Camp Crowder. He was one of the lucky ones. And uh, then my youngest, uh, my other brother was drafted right after the 1st of January, and he was sent to Wyoming. He was in ordinance, and uh, he went overseas in July of 41. And um, my, my, uh, well, she's my sister-in-law now, but uh, my brother had met this gal at a dance, and he told me to call her. She was a very nice person, so I called her. So they corresponded, and he wanted her to come to New York or to New Jersey, where he was stationed at Fort Dix, uh, because he knew he was going overseas. And so her parents would not allow her to go by herself. This girl was 22, but she still paid attention to her parents. And so she, she called me and she said, would you go with me? Well, I didn't have the money, but my mother and dad paid for my way so that I could go with her because she, they, I know they thought he might not come back. How did you keep track of them? where they were? Well, uh, we knew where, that he was going to, to the uh, European theater. Right. And he was sent to England. Well, we went to, we went to uh, Trent, or no, it was, it was Fort Dix, to visit him. And we were there over the 4th of July weekend. And most of the men were supposed to be confined to their base. But uh, because there were so many thousands of them waiting there to go over in a convoy that the officers turned their head when they went into New York for the weekend. <laughs> well, they knew these boys might never come back. And uh, so uh, we visited him for the weekend, and the next week he was sent out. Of course, we didn't hear from him. Or I think he went out the 17th of July. Well, the strange part of it was I found out much, much later that my husband was there at the same time waiting to be transported to England. So and, you, you didn't know your husband at that time? Oh, no. No, no, I didn't know him at all. And he, he was, an, uh, he was uh, working at, at uh, uh, Dayton at Wright Patterson Field. He was an aircraft electrician, and he worked for the civil service, but he decided that if there was a war, he, was, he fought, felt it was his duty to go, so he joined the Air Force. And they sent him over to England as an, as an aircraft electrician. And he was, he was in England for in several different places, in Manchester and Ipswich, but he, he repaired the electrical systems on the B-17s. And you have a connection to B-17s, right? Right. <laughs> well, anyway, he, he uh, uh, was there for two years, and uh, they were asking for volunteers for pilot school, so he put his name in. And uh, they sent him back to the U.S. to go to pilot's training. Well, they did a lot of tests, and by that time, he, when he came back, it was the end of uh, 43. He had been over there for two years. And so he was, uh, uh, they were washing a lot of men out. They had all these men coming back, but you know, the Army was never known for its efficiency. And so uh, he was uh, eliminated because of his something different about his depth perception. So they didn't know what to do with him. They didn't send him back over to be an aircraft electrician, which he was trained to do. They sent him to radio school. And okay, and he went to uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, to the Army Airways Communication School, which was the ground school. And anyone who uh, was involved in the ground school had to have a very high uh, uh, speed in order to take any kind of communications that came across. So those men were required to be able to type 
and to take uh, 16 words a minute on the typewriter. And uh, meanwhile, I had been working at Spiegel's, and and uh, uh, a couple. I was I by that time I had been promoted to be a, a, a department manager, and uh, we did um, uh, solicit or uh, answered complaints, customers' complaints about their accounts, and and Spiegel sold uh, for a long time. They sold merchandise on credit. People would pay a dollar a month for it, but that's how they got started, and they didn't charge anything. Well, the federal, I don't know whether it was the Federal Reserve Board, who was that decided that you could not sell merchandise on credit without, a, without interest. And that was in, I, because Sears was very uh, influential in Montgomery Ward. And, and this little old upstart company was moving along and we're going to be a big challenge to them. So then we had to charge interest. Well, they still managed to have a lot of customers. But anyway, they had complaints about being charged too much or too less. Right. And, and this is the department where I worked. And they decided that they needed to do a better job of, of answering customers' letters, so they would hire some some college girls to uh, write the letters. So they had hired a, a few, and a lot of them were qualified to be teachers, but they couldn't get employment. So these four or five girls came to work for me in this department. I became acquainted with them, and, and one of the gals was, was very, very bright, and she was from she had graduated magna cum laude from Clark College in Dubuque, Iowa, and uh, a nun friend of hers wrote to her. And the nun had, had was at St. Louis University, and uh, she said, "Well, Yvonne, why don't you go? I have inquired and go and apply to this captain for a teaching job down here." because uh, these people are coming to St. Louis University to be trained, and then they teach the soldiers in the, the field of radio. So Yvonne called and made an appointment for herself, and she talked me into doing it too. Well, I didn't think I had a chance because I didn't have a college degree. But I went in and applied. I talked to the, to the captain. He said, oh, yes, you come take the test. Well, the funny part was, after I took the test, I found out I got the highest grade on the code check as for anybody. And this... And what was the code check? Well, that was we had to listen on headphones. We had an, it was an aptitude check is what it was, to see if we would have an aptitude to take code. And it had to do with, uh, with uh, uh, short and long sounds. Morse code. Morse code, yes, yes. And uh, I had a background in music, so it, it wasn't, that helped a lot. So I went to St. Louis University for three months to take the course, and then they sent us out. I had planned to go back to Chicago to the Coliseum, where they were, uh, they had the code school, mm -hmm. and uh, they closed it. They, they were getting enough. This was in, in uh, 40, 43, 42, 42, that they were getting enough co operators. And so they were kind of uh, stopping uh, sending so many to the different areas. Well, they closed the school in Chicago first. The men were billeted at the uh, uh, Stevens Hotel there. And uh, so then we had to choose a different place to go. All the people who had been trained for Chicago had to choose a different place. So I picked Scottfield because it was in Illinois, and I didn't want to be too far from my parents. I was the only kid they had left in this United States. So anyway, I went there to school, and uh, or to teach, and. Uh, we had men, men um, many of them were only 18 or 19 years old, and they came there first to take uh, Morse code. And we worked uh, different shifts. There were three shifts and one, and uh, 
the day shifts were all right, but the night shift was terrible because all the instructors did was wake the men up because the code was monotonous and they would hear it over their headphones and, and doze off. And it was difficult for the instructors to, to have to work that night shift. It was just a waste of money. What, did the, what were the men, once they went through the training, what were they going to do? Well, they were going to be gunners on B-17s. So a gunner needed to know Morse code? Well, see, they, they, they had two jobs. They were the radio operator, but they are, were also the, the you know, waste gunners because that's where the radios were situated. They had to take Morse code, but they also had a division. Uh, they took uh, half a day of the code, and they have, had half a day of mechanics because they would were uh, required to uh, op, uh repair the radios if anything went wrong so they had to know and radios were different then they had a lot of components to them and in order to to get a certain they had to change frequencies depending where they were and they had three controls to change the frequencies it was a whole different kind of radio than people know now and and they would have to contact uh, the uh, ground stations as well as other other planes. And so you were able to also teach them the mechanics in addition? Actually, we took mechanics at, the, the code operators took mechanics at St. Louis U. But no, we were not required. We just had to know a little bit about it and realize and be able to speak with them about it. No, if we were code op uh, t teaching Morse code, we, we were four hours with each class teaching Morse code. And uh, it became pretty mo monotonous. For a long time, I worked in the, in the classrooms doing it, but then I also worked in what we call the, the transmitting room. And I would send code checks at certain, you had to be able to time it for the speed that you were sending. And I would send code checks for, or or practice things. A lot of times, because the, the all the the code came into the rooms on machines, and when they first started to learn, that's all, what they learned were, was from the machines. But that was not like uh, everybody's what they called fist was different, and they had to be able to. Do, and in fact, you could almost distinguish who was sending the code if you knew the people by how it came over. That sounds strange, but it's true. Mm. And uh, anyway, the the uh, uh, students had to pass uh, uh, ten words a minute in order to be an operator on the on the uh, uh, airplane. So that's what your husband was doing too. No, he mm. was in a different division. He was in he was sent to the ground school. Now the ones who was were, he teaching or was he no being he was trained? he was in school he okay. was at, in training, well after uh, um, let's see the beginning of forty three forty four then uh, they closed down the school at uh, Sioux Falls South Dakota, and those people were sent to to uh, Scott, and uh, they changed the whole setup around because. Uh, the uh, uh, we have been training in two areas of Scott for the uh, uh, code groups for the for the uh, um, bomber uh, personnel. Well, then we started. We still had the bomber personnel coming in, but we also had the ground crews. So they took the people who had the highest speeds in code to teach the ones who came in as ground crew. And uh, they had, they're the ones who had to uh, uh, do the 16 words a minute. And so, so I was uh, teaching them. And I also worked in the, in the uh, uh, transmitting room too. You said it was hard sometimes for a woman to find a job. Was there discrimination and problems with women working in? Actually, the government was a lot better than uh, the, the people we had, that I f had the most trouble with, of all things, were not the, per the civilian personnel. 
they were the the uh, the um, non-coms at the uh, that were running the school. They every every room had a non-com, and uh, the shift chief was a non-com. So all of the of the uh, civilian personnel were subject to these non-coms. And there was one staff sergeant that that uh, now I would have had a great case for sexual harassment. I would have because he just would not leave me alone. And and I tried to get onto a different shift, but that didn't work. So I always managed to have someone in between myself and him to keep him from bothering me. A lot of variety among the backgrounds of the people who were working? Yes. One of the things that was interesting, we had uh, in the uh, AACS school, which was the school for the ground operators, a, uh, a man who was uh, had been at Boca Raton. He was a scientist. He had he had two or three advanced degrees in different areas of uh, uh, science, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me that he he was removed from his job in Boca Raton, Florida, where they were doing the radar tests and sonar tests, where radar was finally discovered or, or perfected. And he was working there, and the people in the community were so adamant against the government having him there because he was black. And he was brilliant. So they, they did, the government did not want to, uh, they couldn't conscientiously let him go. They had a lot of black men in the service by then. And so they sent him up to the school in Scott. Well, this man was a, a marvelous, one of the best radio operators I ever encountered. He, had, he could send uh, uh, on, on the bug, the, which is the, uh, the key that goes back and forth for rapid. They called it a bug. Instead of the mouse for our right. computers. Right, right. And he could send it so fast. And he was a very, very entertaining, interesting person. We got to be great friends. I really, when I worked in the transmitting room with him, had a great sense of humor, and I just, I just really did like him. And he had a girlfriend in St. Louis, and and he said they were going to get married, but he wanted to be bad a little while yet. <laughs> and then we had another a woman who was teaching there, and she actually she never got to teach which was a, a, a just terrible. She had come from uh, South Dakota, and she had been working up in South Dakota. Well, they sent her down to Scott, and she was, she was also black, and she was a bact uh, bacteriologist. She had a degree, and she wanted to do something to help the war effort, so this is what she did. She was on leave from the University of Minnesota. And they put this woman in the code room checking, grading the code checks. This is how much she could contribute, they felt. It was, it was really, it was really, I was appalled. I li you know, I lived in Rankin and we had one black family and, and really most of the people treated them just like everybody else. He was the, they were the barbers, and they were my friends. I always had, you know, our family had a great experience with them. But I realized that I heard someone say, well, they kept their place. And I thought, what do you mean their place? You was, certainly had an interesting group of people. How many people do you figure that you would train? Oh. The, the classes lasted about eight weeks. It took about eight weeks for them to go through, or maybe a little longer. And so I had students that went over and, and did their 25 missions on the B-17s and came back. And this is what, a, what really, really got to me, that they were such children almost when they went over. And they came back, and they were tough soldiers.
you know, and some of them didn't come back. I had one young fellow who was from, from uh, Champaign. His parents lived here. And um, uh, he was just 18, and he was so homesick. And uh, three other uh, uh, instructors and I had a house. And we would invite the students sometimes for dinner because we, we really felt sorry for them. They were so homesick. Of course, we had to worry about our ration stamps, too, because most of the, we didn't have any better deal on the ration stamps than anybody else did, and there were so many restrictions on what our food was. And it also depended on what you could find at the grocery store at the time. Well, Belleville had a marvelous, marvelous little grocery. The people were German. There were a lot of Germans in Belleville. And they had wonderful sausages and cheeses and that sort of thing. Well, this, this young fellow's mother would send him ration stamps, and he'd say to me, Miss Morrow, would you get me some food with this? because the food there was sea rations. When I first went to, this is beside the point, but when I first went to Belleville, uh, we, the, the instructors were allowed to eat in the, their lunch in the mess hall, and it cost 35 cents. And so we would eat because we would get meat, which we didn't get all the time at home. And uh, it was very good food. Well, all of a sudden they barred the, uh, personnel from eating in the in the uh, mess hall and they changed the rations some new I suppose the new commander came in and they started giving them C, C rations which were pretty pretty skimpy and so these men really didn't get enough to eat part of it was training for being in the field I know that because uh, they wouldn't get the same things when they were overseas, it's that they got here anyway. And so they were all hungry. And they would eat things at the mess hall, but their money, $21 a month, it didn't last very long at the, I mean, at the PX. It didn't last very long at the PX. So they would, uh, they would, uh, the mother sent the, the boy the ration stamps. And he'd ask me if I'd get him some food in town. So we would go to the grocery store and get him a lot of, and, and all these buddies just loved him because he'd share with them, you know. But we often had him, when he, it was his day off, we'd have him come and have dinner with us. Well, later on, after he had left, been gone from there a long time, after I, actually after I moved back to my folks' house, after I was married, uh, one of our friends there had been in the radio. He had been a radio operator, and he was in the South Pacific, and he came by to see me because he know, knew what I had done. And he told me that uh, that this this boy from Champagne, he mentioned that, that he knew him. And I said, well, whatever happened to John? Is he okay? And he said, no, he was lost over the Pacific and, and uh, never found. So that that really bothers person, you know, because I was really very fond of this. And he was way younger than I was, but he was just such a sweet boy and so innocent. I guess maybe that's what bothered me. But anyway, the, the um, after, oh, the ACACS moved down there, my husband had been sent to uh, uh, Madison. Well, then they took closed the school at Madison. So all that personnel and the, the men were sent into Scott Field. And one day I had to take a class for someone else who was absent. Well, they had, they had a big problem with flooding of the Mississippi and the, they called the men from Scott out to work on the dock, on the, uh, the dikes. And so uh, for some days there, we had absolutely nobody in school. We went to work, but we didn't have anybody in school because they, had, uh, they were working on the, on the dikes to stop the river from coming up any higher. So anyway, this one day, why, uh, uh, I was sent to a different classroom to teach. And that's where I met my husband. He was one of the students. And I thought, well, he looks older than the rest of them because we were getting 18-year-olds. 
you know. And uh, I guess maybe the thing that impressed me most was his hands. He had huge hands, but he was so well kept. It just looked beautiful. <laughs> anyway, anyway, after uh, at, when we had the, our break, while well, he came over and started talking to me, he said, you know, I need some help. He was having a real hard time with coat. So I said, okay, I'll help you. That's what we were supposed to do. So I sent him coat, you know. But then after that, I was went back to my own class, but he always found me during our break to have conversation, tell me how he was getting along and everything. And uh, one of the other fellows, after about five or six weeks of this, said to him, Schneider, why don't you ask for her for a date? And he said, well, I will as soon as we have a day off that's the same because we had different days off because of our, and we were working the night shift. So anyway, after after uh, uh, we got on the day shift, well, he did ask me to go out to a movie and uh, it was gonna be on his day off, which was the following week on a Wednesday night. And on Sunday, I, it was uh, we were on the morning shift, so we went to work at six in the morning and worked till two in the afternoon. And after the shift on Sunday, uh, I went into the PX and was sitting there waiting because they had a special dispensation. To, then they didn't have mass at the Catholic Church during the uh, uh, afternoons. But they had a special dispensation because it was a military operation. So I thought, well, I'll just go out here. So I waited after after I got done work at the PX to go to Mass. And um, Jack came in and sat down to talk to me. And he said, well, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, I'm waiting to go to church. And in a little while, he excused himself. And he said, well, I have to go back to the barracks. And I'll see you later. So he left. And when I got up to go to church, here he is coming in his class A uniform toward me. And I said, well, where are you going? He said, I'm going to church with you. So that's the first place we ever went together. Better than a movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, then he had to, uh, after he got out of school there, they sent him to teletype school in, Scott, in, in uh, Chanute. He went from the radio school right. to teletype school. Right. Well, he was he was already a sergeant, and uh, they handled him a little differently than they did some of the other boys. He did he was too big to be a gunner. He couldn't be a gunner, and uh, um, I guess they had the personnel they needed for most of the stations, and they sent him so that he would be equipped to handle a better job when he got to to the uh, radio station he was supposed to be assigned to. And what did someone do in teletype school? They learned teletype. Well, to do? Well, it, it came over a teletype machine and they had to be able to read it and also, and, and it was encoded, all, the, all okay. everything was encoded. And the, uh, 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 be able to send out messages on teletype, be able to repair the equipment and all that sort of thing. So he was six weeks at Chinook. So because it was close and, and I came up to visit my folks in Rankin on the bus, he'd get on the bus and ride up and spend the weekend at my folks' house. And my mother, first time she saw him, fell in love with him. That was important to me. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, he was there for, for six weeks. And after he left down there, then the, the, they um, uh, sent a whole new battalion in to the second area where I worked. And uh, they were barracks after barracks of black men. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't one white man in the group. They put all the white ones over in the, in the third area. All the white men were assigned mm -hmm. to the third area. And all the men that, we, that were in the second area were black. Right. Were they learning the same thing as your husband? Or yes, they... yes. And I taught them and it didn't bother me. Right. I would have to say that probably they were much more respectful. I never had a problem with any of my students in the black group. I think maybe 
I don't know whether they felt privileged to be there or anxious to learn or what the reason was, but we didn't have discipline problems with them. Was, the, was this like decoding secret messages? Yes, they would be, yeah. See, we didn't teach any of the, they changed the code every day. The cycle groups that they had to take were five, uh, five uh, uh, different uh, figures, but there were four, four letters and a number for each cycle group. Now they sent weather the same way, but the weather was sent with the uh, numbers, and there were five numbers. The weather you could, was was numbered, just numbers that came over the over the uh, wire, and the uh, uh, cycle groups, and those were were uh, changed every day. And when they got on the airplanes or or were in the stations, they were not advised of what the code would be for the day until they got the message early in the morning. So it was to, of course, to keep the enemy from knowing because anybody in the air could intercept those messages. And so when the, when the uh, person on the, in the uh, uh, air uh, received the message from a ship or something, he had to decode it first before they understood, before he could even tell the pilot what it was. So, so weather would be to tell them what they'd be flying into, right. and the other would be what, giving them directions what to do? Or? Right, right. And, and telling them, for instance, if there was a ship someplace, or, or, or giving them an idea about, about their destination as bombers and that sort of thing. And of course, they had to have the weather if they were, uh, especially going over that English Channel, which is where a lot of them went directly to, because most of their air bases at that time were in England. It wasn't until after D-Day that they had any air bases in France or any other part of Europe. And of course, there were some in Africa too, but most of them went out from England and they had, had long-range bombers. That's what the B-17s were. Where was your husband that he was doing the... He was in the Ipswich, which was right outside of London. And he was there during the Blitz. And uh, they had to go to bomb shelters very much at the time. And this I did not know until he passed away last year. He told one of my kids about it. He never told me about being in a supply truck and having to go to pick up supplies for his unit. And... Um, um, he uh, and another fellow went in, and the fellow was driving the truck, and he said to Jack, you go in and get out, stay with the truck, because they couldn't leave the truck, somebody would steal them blind. So he went in to get whatever it was. When he came back out, the, the truck had been hit by a bomb, and the man was dead. Oh. So he, but he, they spent a lot of time in the bomb shelters and, and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. You said your husband had some pretty exciting secret stuff to do, though. Well, he did. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. That was here, though. That was when he, after, after he uh, left the uh, Chanute, they sent him out to Fort Ord, California. Now, why, I don't know. He, was he thought he was going to be shipped to the Pacific. And they, uh, but because he had two years of overseas duty already, instead they shipped him to Wichita Falls, Texas. Well, we were engaged and, and we had talked it over and neither one of us were really, we weren't 18 years old, we were a little older. And uh, so we decided to go ahead and get married. So he's, he made the arrangements down at, Scott, at uh, Shepherd Field, and I had uh, I had left my job and went home to Rankin to be with my folks a couple of weeks, and my mother was going down with me. We had everything arranged, so uh, we went down and we were married at Shepherd Field, Texas. Well, instead of being sent overseas, they sent him to Cincinnati, Ohio, which was his hometown. Yeah, to Lunkin Airport there. Well, he was there for uh, about six or eight weeks. And then they, they uh, 
he got new orders to go to Minneapolis. And he was assigned as ch station chief at Old Chamberlain Field in Minneapolis. And this is why he had to have both the code and the uh, the teletype because he was a non-com and they wanted a non-com to run the station. So he was assigned as, as station chief. Well, I went to Minneapolis for a while, but we could not find a place to live. We lived in a, a private home, people who had uh, uh, allowed uh, soldiers to live there because they felt they needed to do something for the war effort. They were wonderful, wonderful people, and they were so nice to us. But we just had a room, and I was I got pregnant right away. So, so my mother said, "Well, you have to come back home." And there was always a place, you know, enough space for me there. So I came back to Rankin, and he was still at at, uh, at uh, Old Chamberlain. And in uh, uh, what was in late July, first of August, in in uh, uh, forty forty five, it was yeah. That uh, of course the war in Europe was over by then, because uh, uh, Hitler had finally surrendered. But the Japan, the Japanese were still holding out. So um, this one night he got a message that, uh, or he got a message earlier in the day that no one was supposed to be at the station except him that night. And he was going to have, and it had to be top secret, he was going to have some a duty to perform and he needed to, to send uh, weather reports to this squadron that was flying over Canada. And then he had to uh, send a teletype message to a special address in Washington, D.C. Uh, of their position. And he had to do this every half hour. And, and uh, he had contact with this group of planes until they were out in the, uh, all, almost across the Pacific Ocean. And he told me about it afterward, but he said, I don't know what it was. And uh, a few days later, when the bomb landed on Hiroshima, he realized that he had been uh, sending the weather reports to the Enola Gay group that went across Canada. So it took a lot of little people to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Did your brothers all live through it, and your husband? Yes, yes, they all did. Uh, my my brother, who was in France, well, he went. He was the one that was in the in ordinance, and he went over to uh, France by, or to to England about the same time Jack did, and he was there for until after D Day, and I don't know exactly what they did in all that time, but anyway, he went in. Uh, to uh, France 10 days after D-Day. And he was with ordnance and they were putting up communication lines for the troops as they came in. But the only thing he really told me very much about was that, that he, he, uh, he was sick because he walked, he, they had to walk and do their work, and he said, Mom, you wouldn't believe the dead bodies that we had to pass. And we couldn't stop to see who they were, what, whether they were American or not, because they had a crew that came along and did that, but he said the stench was unbelievable. And he, he went into uh, uh, Germany after, after the troops, you know, and it was part of the, the, the uh, well, I don't know what they called it, the ones that were there after. But he was, he came home, uh, of course they were doing that all during the summer that year, and he was sent back. He was one of the first ones that was able to come, were, was able to come back and was discharged. And then my brother in, in Missouri, was discharged shortly. Now, they began to discharge everybody, but my brother in Panama came back in um, in 
August the year before. He had been in Panama for four years. And it was very, very sad because he had a terrible drinking problem. And they sent him down to Eglin Field in Florida for R&R. &R. And he was a staff sergeant by then. And um, he was he was mustered out right after right after the 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 uh, bombing of Hiroshima. He was the first one that came home, but he never talked very much about what happened to him. And there there was not anything on the uh, the Ken Burns show that that showed anything about any activity in the Gulf of Mexico. But from what he the few things that he said. I am sure there had to have been some, and he saw a lot of things that were not ever talked about. He went down, he was 18 years old, and when he came back, he was just like an old man. It, was, it had to be a terrible experience for him. And then I had a cousin who, was, who had gone here to school at the University of Illinois, and he was in the marching band, and he was in ROTC. Well, he was he was called up in uh, 1944, and in in they went to uh, boot camp for a certain length of time, and then he was sent over to England, and uh, he was one of uh, his his uh, battalion was one of the group in the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, he wrote his mother on the first day that he was in the battle that. It was the awfulest thing. He said, I can't believe that we have to kill these men. He said, it's just almost more than I can bear. Well, the next day he was captured. He was captured with a whole group of men in the Battle of the Bulge. And they sent him across, across Germany and to a prison camp in Poland. Well, his parents didn't know where he was. He was now the 14th of December is when it happened in '44. And he was in uh, the, this German prison. He was reported missing in action. And he was there for four or five months. And um, they, the prison was in Poland. And the uh, Russians had begun to fight back. They began to fight the Germans back. And they were pushing the German troops back. And Hitler, like Napoleon, thought he could overtake Russia, and he didn't. He didn't think about all the things that his troops weren't used to that they confront in Russia. But anyway, the, this this one day they could hear the Russian guns, and the Germans were pushing him, these prisoners. They took them out of the prison camp and were marching them back to Germany. And uh, this one night they stayed in a, uh, a Polish uh, at a Polish farm in the barn. And uh, Ralph said he made up his mind he was not going back to Germany and be in another prison camp. So he hid in the straw. He and another fellow. Well, a lot of the guys had the same idea. But when the Germans came in and threatened to machine gun the the straw when they came out. Well, they knew the two men were there, so they just sprayed it with the bullets, but they were in a hurry, so they left, and he was he escaped. And uh, the Polish farmer fed them. He knew they were there, and he came out at night and brought them food. And then one morning, the, there was a, a German patrol that had stayed there in the barn at night, so they couldn't go to sleep. They were afraid they might make a noise and wake them up. And then they heard these men come up on horseback the next morning, and it was uh, Cossacks, Russian Cossacks. And they, they just mercilessly shot the Germans. And then they saw the American boys, the two American boys, so they took them back to their lines. and. Uh, they hitchhiked to Moscow to the, to the American embassy. So he was gone for almost six months before he got back to the U.S. When did his parents find out that he was living? Well, after, after he had been missing for 
about three months, they got word and they knew that he was not, he hadn't been killed, but he was in, a, in prison. And what was interesting, they had this, this um, uh, page in the Gazette about the uh, uh, prison camp, the German prison camp in Hoopston. Well, his mother and dad lived in Hoopston. He was an only child. And um, his mother was very active in the church there. Well, the most, uh, a lot of the young German men were, were Catholics. And so they allowed them to come to Mass on Sunday. Well, Germany, uh, the whole of Bavaria is Catholic. And so they must have been a lot of them from that area of Germany. And they didn't want to go back to Germany. They definitely didn't want to. So they weren't going to try to escape. They were getting good food. They were a lot better off here than going back. None of them wanted to go back and fight. A few of them could speak English. So she got acquainted with a couple of them. She used to take them cookies and this sort of thing. And then to have her son end up in a German prison camp, that was very difficult for her. But he always said, well, Mom spent all her time. I was in there on her knees, so I know that that sure helped me. So anyway, that was that was just a, one of the things that happened during the war. Did your family have a big celebration when everybody came back? Oh yes, the first time, first time we had been together for Christmas for so much, so long, and uh, uh, my younger brother, my oldest brother got married after he was in Fort Dix, so my folks never got to his wedding. My youngest brother uh, was ready to go overseas, and he was there, and he was his best man before he went to Panama, and this was before the war even started. And then then after Greg got, and of course Jack and I got married, mm -hmm. and my mother did get to go to that. And then my brother Greg, uh, came back, and this girl that that I had gone to uh, uh, New York with, and he got married. Well, she and I had been really, really good friends. After I first met her, we, we used to meet and have dinner together, and, and when i go down to Rankin to visit my folks, she'd go with me on the train, and so my parents knew her real well, and I really liked her. And so it was, it was kind of great that he they decided to get married. So that my parents did get to go to their wedding, which was good. And uh, and so we were all there on Christmas. And Jack had gotten, he was the last one to be discharged from Minneapolis. And he and two other fellas decided that they were going to, they got uh, money for their their railroad. Fund. They had to go all the way from Minneapolis to Portland, Oregon to be discharged. And it was a, a really, really cold winter. We had a lot of snow and ice, and it was, it was bitterly cold. But they decided that they'd pool their money and buy this old junk heap of a car. And then when they got out, why this one fellow wanted the car, so he said, I'll just buy the car from you. And we'll save some money by by driving instead of instead of going on the train. Well, they got out in in Idaho at the Coeur d'Alene Pass, and were just to pass that, and they ran out of gas, and it was twenty below zero, and they were stuck out in the middle of almost nowhere. Well, they had passed a farm house about three miles back. So they drew straws on who was going to stay in the car. A couple of them were going to stay in the car, and the other two were going to walk back to the farmhouse to get some gas. And Jack stayed in the car. Well, he and the other fellow were just dozing off, which was a very bad thing to do when it was that cold. And this big gas truck pulled up alongside him. Are you having trouble, fellas? And he saw they were soldiers, and they said, well, we're out of gas. And he said, well, you know, my, my gas tanks are locked, but we may be able to get some gas out of the hose. So they got enough gas out of the hose to start the car and get it to go back to the, to the farmhouse. So the woman at the farmhouse had been, uh, her husband was, was uh, laid up with, with the back problem, so she was trying to take care of her animals and everything. So the boys helped her with the animals, and she fixed them breakfast, yeah. and then they bought, bought gas and got to Portland. Well, then I didn't hear from him all that time. 
that he was going and I didn't know where he was. And we were hearing on the radio how people were freezing in their cars in in Montana and Idaho. And uh, so when he finally called me from North Portland, why well, I was very much relieved. Well, then he took, I said, don't you dare come back in that car. <laughs> so he took the train back and he got into Houston at the 23rd of December, just two days before Christmas. Yeah, so we were all together. So, and that was, that was great for my parents. They were just so happy that it happened. Yeah. And of course, the, the, uh, whole thing about food and everything that you, you, they, we were, of course, didn't, weren't rationed anymore, but things were still very hard to get. And of course, appliances, that was terrible During, because you couldn't buy an appliance. They hadn't made any, you couldn't buy a new car. And uh, so we bought an old, a house that my grandparents had built in Hooksdown, Illinois and moved in there. Well, we didn't have, we didn't have a furnace. Neither one of us had ever lived in a house that didn't have a bathroom. And this did not have a bathroom. And it did not have a furnace. And it did, of course, we had to use a cook stove in the kitchen. And we bought a, a, a warm morning heater for the dining room. And uh, it was uh, it was pretty rough for a while, but I got a washer because the man who ran the appliance store was I had known him since I was a little kid, and he said you got and I had two babies by then. You need the washer better more than anybody I know, so I got the washer, and then we had a had to have a an ice box rather than a refrigerator, and of course you had to have a pan underneath to catch the water as the ice melted. Invariably, Jack it was never used to that, and he would never remember to empty it. So you got in the kitchen, be walking in, in ice cold water in the morning. <laughs> but we lived through it, and, and he had a lot of help. My dad and, and a couple of our, one of our farmer friends came in with a scoop and helped him dig the basement. And he put, we put he did most of the work himself. My brother helped him. We, we put a, a, a furnace in the basement and, and he put in the bathroom. And by the time we got the house painted, he was working for an uh, insurance company by then and they transferred him to Champaign. Tell me, looking back at it all, was it worth it? Oh, yes. And so, you know, we had some good times in that little house. My brother and his wife, my youngest brother and his wife lived there, and they had two little boys. And, and on Saturday night, they would, they didn't have a car either, so they get in a taxi. We didn't have a car for years. He get, they get in a taxi and, and come, and we'd play pinochle all evening. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they stayed all night because we had a lot more room. He, they moved into, they built a lot of, of temporary housing, which is still there in Hoopston for uh, returning servicemen. And all, um, they were two bedroom houses with, uh, and they were rentals. And my brother and his wife lived in one of those. And uh, they went from that to taking care of the migrant workers. I don't know what they're using them for now, but I don't think they've ever torn them down. They called them tin houses, but there was a lot. There were a lot of temporary houses after the war. It must have been a relief, though, after worrying about people being away. Oh, it was. It was great to have people home. So we never ever took that for granted again, because uh, and I, in when the the uh, Korean War came around, well, or no the. Vietnam War, my boys, my older boys were, had to register for the draft. Well, the, my oldest son decided he was going to join the Navy. And uh, he was up at uh, Great Lakes, but they sent him home because he could not wear the uniform. He was extremely allergic to wool. And then none of, none of the other ones were ever called, so. What's the, what's the biggest lesson you think you all learned? I suppose, to, I think it, for me, it was appreciating every day we had and, uh, and uh, 
enjoying the small things because we did without a lot, you know, and nothing was imp as important as the people that were close to you and your family. Yeah. Yeah. My family's always been very, very important. Now I have 29 grandchildren and 27 great-grandchildren. And, wow. and uh, most of them live around here. I'm so lucky. Now, some of them, the, the, the children are moving away, but I have all of my children, well, I have 11, and f four of them do not live here. You had 11 children? Mm-hmm. Seven boys and four girls. Well. And, and yeah. Uh, um, yeah. they all come home. That's wonderful. They do. And there are times that they come there to see one another. If one is home, then they all have to come right. and see the rest right. of them. Is there, we're just about out of time. Is there anything you want to add? No. No? Okay. Well, she said no. I, I, can't, I can't think of much of else, except I, th I think my parents were very courageous. What else could they do? Right. What do you, do you want to? Okay, this is the second tape with Frances Snyder, and we were just about to talk about what you thought about your parents, how they lived through it. Well, they were very courageous. They really were because they had uh, the, her, their three sons, and, and my, my brother who lived in, who was in Panama was not very good about communications. He, uh, we didn't hear very much from him at all, and there were times that we didn't know whether he was still there or not. And even the communications from overseas weren't all that good. You uh, would write the emails and, and uh, uh, hope that they would get to them. And, and I gathered that there were a lot more going from here to there than came back. Although uh, Jack wrote a lot to his parents because uh, his father kept every single one that Jack wrote from from England and had them filed in in uh, order of date yeah. he was he was very German and very meticulous about it and every time he wrote a letter he would make a carbon copy and keep the letter even if it was just a personal letter I know yes. <laughs> at least he could do that because he wasn't on the front right right and he was uh, he was a uh, uh, civil defense uh, uh, I don't know what you call him, but he ran the civil defense organization in their neighborhood. So he was in, in Cincinnati. They were, you know, they had blackouts and, and uh, they did a lot of collecting of, of uh, we did save everything. That was one of the things we learned to recycle, old tires and, and uh, uh, any kind of metal and fat. There was a jar on the stove that anything you cooked, you poured the fat into it and, and uh, poured off the water and saved it for munitions. And of course, anything metal and any appliance or anything like that. Old tires, I did mention that. I have an interesting story about a car. When I worked at Spiegel's, I, uh, one of my friend's husband, was was drafted and he was in the navy and she had a little apartment that she did not want to to uh, give up and she asked me if I'd come and live with her well I was living in a sleeping room and it was kind of nice to be able to cook our food and everything so I moved in with her for a while and she had a car so he had taught her to drive before they left before he left for the uh, navy and so uh, she drove to work every morning, and we had a group of people we'd picked up, and everybody contributed their gas stamps so that we would be able to drive to work because you had to have stamps in order to buy gasoline. And so uh, this one day after work, while we were uh, going out to get in the car, and I stopped to speak to somebody, and she came running back in. She said, my car is gone. And uh, so she called the police, and they came, and 
answer, she answered their questions, but the car was stolen out of the parking lot where she had it at work. And uh, of course, then we had to take the streetcar home. And uh, about a month later, the police called her. They had found her car, and it was put up on on blocks, and the tires were gone. So she got the car back, but not the tires. They didn't really want the car, they all wanted the tires. <laughs> and so it sat in a garage for the rest of the rest of the war until uh, they began manufacturing tires again because we didn't she didn't have uh, see people who worked in defense industries were able to get tires mm -hmm. and to get gasoline too because they had to be at work. But we weren't in a we weren't in a defense industry, so we couldn't do it. Just another change. Of change, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, yeah, it was. But it was interesting that they they really didn't want to trash the car, and it made a difference because uh, it was up on the blocks. Then at least they put it on blocks when they took the took right. the tires. They were off polite of to it. you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, the same way with the the uh, food now. Uh, it was hard sometimes, even if you had ration stamps, you couldn't get the uh, the merchandise because they didn't have it. They, it wasn't shipped in, for instance, to Rankin, to the, to the little uh, butcher shop. Uh, somebody would go in and ask, do you have any meat today? And the butcher would tell them what he had, and then it'd be all over town in 10 minutes, and there'd be a big line <laughs> to get the kind of meat they had. And my mother had uh, uh, chickens. She raised chickens, so she always had the eggs and and uh, the chickens, you know, which was a big advantage. And they had their garden, so we always had fresh vegetables and that sort of thing. But you also noticed it in restaurants that they didn't have the extensive menus. And it was good for people to have to do without a little bit. Because we certainly didn't starve, not like some of the people in the European countries. Right. So that was just another part of the war that affected everybody. Right. Anything else you want to add? What? Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I can't think of anything. Okay. I think I've covered a lot. Well, that's okay. It's a wrap then. Thank you. This has <laughs> okay. been fascinating. Time is, oh my gosh, I've been talking a long time. Well, you 